Let's get a big round of applause for Frank Skoda, please. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, my name is Frank Schröder. I work for eBay Classifieds Group here in Amsterdam. So we're sitting at the Amsterdam station. Um, and today I want to talk to you about uh, a project that I've been uh, I've been working on in um, in my group, um, which is uh, which I call Fabio, which is a um, router HTTP router that we've written in Go to solve a specific problem that we have. Um, so first. Why would anybody build a new router? Because, I mean, there is already a bunch of them out there. So we have Nginx, Apache, Varnish, uh, Squid. You can use any of these software routers in order to do HTTP routing. Um, internally, we're using uh, a Netscaler, um, which is like uh, ridiculously expensive uh, units, which we have to use uh, um, for SSL termination routing. Um, but we would we actually need them in all of our environments, so in all the dev environments, staging environments, and so forth. Then there are more um, more recent ones uh, like Vulkan and Traffic, uh, which uh, um, try to tackle the HTTP routing um, uh, in a different in a different way. So for one, um, uh, our language of choice has been has been Go for the last two years. So I've been playing with this. I've been programming Go for the last two to three years uh, full time. So it was. Uh, it started really out as a as a toy project to see you know how far I could push this, um, because what we uh, what we are currently doing is is transforming um, uh, mic uh, microservices architecture uh, written in Java into a multi-tenant software as a service kind of thing, and we, we were constantly stumbling in config management issues. So how do we roll out a new service across all of our environments? So generally it meant. Uh, reconfiguring all the load balancers, so waiting a couple of days until this all would uh, trickle down uh, throughout the uh, entire architectures. So, the way we're currently dealing with microservices, and I think the, you know, the landscape since I've started thinking about this has, has already changed because it's, it's moving, everything is moving so fast. Is, um, with, a, with a microservice approach, and the agile development, you really want fast turnaround times. So you're constantly refactoring, so which means you have to constantly change your, your setup and your environment is constantly changing. Um, you have continuous integration and delivery, you have multiple environments you're deploying stuff to. The development laptop should actually be your first QA environment where you could run, where you should be able to run your entire stack uh, natively. Um, we have auto scaling, so at some point you may have only two instances and then you have 100 uh, and then you have again only five. Uh, which may be for cost reasons, but then um, also for maintenance. So, what it looked like uh, a couple of months ago, um, still, uh, was something like this. So we had a router, um, uh, and then which would route incoming requests to a bunch of front-end services, which would then route their requests to uh, via load balancer and, and VIPs um, to a bunch of back-end services, which would uh, maybe use the same load balancer in order to talk to each other. So the problem with this approach is that um, you have a vital piece of configuration in these, in these components, sitting in these components. Without that, your application won't function. Um, so if I try to replicate that on my, my MacBook, um, well, I either need a Netscaler in a, so if I really want to replicate the environment that we have um, in development and staging and production, I would need a Netscaler uh, in a virtual machine, or I would need to simulate something with an HA proxy. Uh, I would, but then that configuration is different than the one that I have downstream. So the other thing is that I can't really version that information the way with uh, the way I'm doing this with with all the with the entire application. So every time I'm making a change, I'm adding another endpoint or I'm adding another service. Um, you know, I have to update all this configuration throughout the entire environments. So. Obviously, we've come up with, with a couple of better solutions uh, for this. So um, service discovery is certainly something that, that helps a lot uh, with the microservices, uh, um, with microservice architecture. So in essence, you just uh, um, have a registry, uh, call it Zookeeper, etcd. Um, you could even probably even do it with MySQL if you wanted to. Or in our case, we've chosen to, to pick console. So all your backend services, or in essence, all your services, they just start up, they register, they says, well, you can reach me on this IP address and port, and then um, you know, go connect to me. So all that static configuration on the backend load balancer is gone. So now the only problem is how do I get my incoming HTTP traffic actually routed to my front end services. Um, the HashiCorp guys have built a tool um, that allows you to, to leverage the existing, um, existing software-based uh, load balancers. Um, they call it console template. 
In essence, what it does is it listens to console uh, and then uh, looks for changes, and then based on a template that you, uh, that you provide, it will uh, generate a configuration file for the software, um, for the software load balancer of your choice. Um, so in this case, I've used HAProxy as an example because it's uh, something that, you know, if you Google for, well, how do I do this uh, with microservices, what you, what you stumble across a lot. So, but now you've just moved the problem because now your vital configuration lives in this console template. Um, because if you add a new service, you have to make sure that you roll this out first before you actually start up the service and uh, so that um, the, the deployment, so now rolling out the console template becomes part of your deployment process. It has to be because otherwise your incoming requests won't be routed properly. Um, the other thing is that um, all, these, um, all these older um, uh, software routers weren't really designed for environments um, which are changing uh, at the rate that, that microservices uh, um, uh, cloud setups are changing. So if you think just a couple of steps ahead and you have unikernels which can, which can boot up in 20 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds which only live for like maybe a couple of seconds, uh, you have a routing table which is just constantly changing. And, and these tools just weren't designed for that. They were designed for an, a time uh, when you could manage the configuration with, with Puppet and, and you had 30 seconds or a minute or five or half an hour a day to actually roll this out uh, um, conveniently across your entire platform. So there is a, actually a long blog post on, uh, on the Yelp engineering page uh, where they uh, um, explain in gory detail which kind of um, steps they had to take in order to make um, true zero downtime restarts for their HA proxy. Uh, there are tricks like, okay, so you need to have another program which, uh, which captures the listening socket and then hands it off to another executable so that you, know, you don't lose any of these connections. So, the point is that the services already know which routes they serve because you've written code for it. So you've written a servlet handler or a, a router or an HTTP handler, no matter in which, which framework you're using, you've written a piece of code which says, well, if the HTTP request method is this and the URI looks like that, then please execute this piece of code. So the only thing that's really missing is the part where you publish that information in the registry as well and then uh, a software router essentially has all the information it needs in order to build a routing table on the fly. So, and that's in essence what Fabio does. So Fabio is, is completely stateless, so you just run it, and it attaches itself to console, and it watches for changes, because console will, you know, in essence you do a long poll uh, on the console API, and it will tell you, well, now the internal state has changed, um, and then Fabio goes on and uh, asks console, okay, so please give me the current version of your state. Uh, and then it builds a routing table from that, um, computes it completely, entirely in memory, and then it does an atomic switch so that the routing engine, um, in essence, just uh, sees the new routing table as of the next request. So by definition and by design, there is no need to may do any fancy things for zero downtime restarts because this thing never goes down because it doesn't have to. So by using console, uh, and that, um, so Fabio isn't designed to work only with console, but that is the use case we had, so we're, um, we're gonna have uh, um, additional backends coming up. Um, but with, with console, there is a specific, uh, um, there is a specific challenge um, that, uh, well, the good thing about console is that it treats service discovery and service registration as a first class citizen. Uh, so we don't really have to have to do anything special or come up with a convention of you know making service discovery work there, um, but it doesn't allow you to attach any kind of meta information to uh, the service registration. So the service just says I'm running on on this IP address on this port, uh, and here's my health checks uh, for you to figure out whether I'm still alive. But you can't attach a, an arbitrary piece of data to it, which which allows uh, which would allow us to publish the route. So. There is a key value store that you could use, um, but then you have the problem that uh, um, the service registration and the update of the key value store would be out of sync, so you would en enter with all kinds of uh, um, race conditions, so what happens if you kill minus nine in the service, or the machine dies, who's gonna clean up with, with entries that uh, are supposed to be gone but aren't. But the major thing is that it wouldn't really work with, with any, uh, you know, at least it wouldn't work out of the box with any third party application. So if, you have, if you're using something like Registrator that registers your Docker container in, in console, then Registrator would have to know how to create an entry in the key value store that is compatible with Fabio. Yep. 
So um, I kind of hijacked the, the tags feature for this. So um, in, in essence, I'm, I'm just attaching, so you can attach a, a number of tags uh, along with the service. And since the metadata that I have uh, along with, uh, with uh, for, uh, to, to build this routing information is, is actually quite small, um, this, this kind of works. So what you do is then when you, when you register uh, a service in console, uh, you just provide a, a prefix, uh, a tag with, uh, with this format, which is URL prefix dash and then host path. And that's all that Fabio needs in order to build the routing table. So what does this look like? Um, so we got the services here um, saying, well, I'm service A, listening on this IP address, this port, and here's my tag. Same for service B and C. So then Fabio flips this around, builds these commands, and then can build a routing table from that. So there's only one small catch. Now I have a system which is completely stateless and self-contained and is auto-configured, but you know, what if I made a mistake? Never happens, but you know, so what if? Um, so, well, the obvious answer is, well, I have to make a new deployment. So I fix the bug in the code, I fix the bug in the configuration, the routes that need to be announced, uh, and then I make a new deployment. Well, that's fine if you are in a place where your service deployments are actually so blazingly fast through the pipeline that you can afford to do that. But in most cases, I think, um, well, at least in our case, we're not there yet. Right? So it still takes us 20 minutes to an hour to get something uh, out of production. So the way I've, uh, I've tackled this is that um, I allow for manual overrides. So you can, use the same, uh, you can use the same configuration commands that Fabio uses in order to generate the routing table. Uh, and append this to the um, to the routing uh, to the auto-generated routing table. So this allows you to delete routes that shouldn't be there, add routes that you forgot, um, add host names, um, so that you can then uh, fix this in your normal deployment, then verify on the next uh, on the next deploy. Well, this is fine, and then you can just uh, remove the overrides. Okay. So what does this actually look like? Let's see if this works. So, can you use this here? Yeah. Okay. Um, the server is still up. Hang on. Shift this down. Shift this down. Shift this down. Shift this down. So as any good um, good Go program, uh, it compiles really fast, um, and then I can just run it. So there's no configuration file necessary. It has attached itself to um, to console, so and it's now it now gets a, a notification from console. This is the current state that it has, and the the state number is an ever increasing number. So if I look at console, I see Fabio has registered itself. If I look at the Fabio user interface. Uh, in the routing table, there is just nothing. Yeah. So now let's start up a service. So in this case, uh, I'm running a, a demo service that's running on port 5000 that has the name service A and that is serving the prefix foo. So as soon as I start the service, um, Fabio noticed that uh, the health uh, information of the service has changed. And we have to wait one second until uh, console has actually determined that the service is up. Um, and then it, um, then Fabio has uh, created a new routing table entry, um, which is this here. Uh, if you look here, then the entry is already there. Um, I can start a, another service, uh, another instance of the same service. So I'm running it on port 5001. Um, routing table has been updated. Service is there, and I can also see the weight is equally distributed between these two services. Um, so now I can start uh, the service B, which is serving a different, uh, a different prefix, and I have three services, service A, two instances, 50%, service B, um, 60%, 100%. So if I now determine, well, service B, that was actually a mistake, um, that shouldn't be there. Um, I can just add a manual overwrite, save it, and the route is gone. So what you need to understand is that because this, uh, um, this override is stored in console, all Fabio instances, because uh, it's, it needs to be high, highly available. 
all five, uh, five year instances will pick this up immediately. So we have, uh, we have uh, six instances running next to each other. At MarkLads we have like eight or ten instances running next to each other. So you make one config change uh, and it's uh, changed on all instances right away. Um, the other um, thing that we can do is that we can, uh, let's assume we have a service um, uh, that where we accidentally um, configure the route um, that we shouldn't have. So um, service A is now announcing both uh, service foo, service bar. Um, and we say, well, that is actually not what we want. Um, then we can also be more specific. And the route is gone. Okay? So it's only service B that's serving service, uh, that's serving uh, slash bar now. Okay, so manual overrides I've, uh, I've explained, so they're appended. So in essence, you, you just get two strings which are appended, and then there's a parser which parses these commands, uh, constructs one object, and then inside the proxy code, there's an atomic swap that, that flips this. So and if you look at the, the code that does the actual routing and proxying, we're talking about 300 lines of code, but that is the HTTP proxy, the web service proxy, uh, plus some other stuff. Everything around it, um, is, is just configuration management, is registration with console, is parsing, is, you know, it's very, so the, the actual core of the, uh, um, of the router is very, very simple. Um, I've showed that we can have multiple prefixes for, for one service, so um, besides the fact that this can be a bug, it can also be a feature, so we're using it, uh, for example, um, if we have a, um, so we have a SOAP endpoint, which we really want to get rid of uh, um, in one of the Java servers and move it to a Go service, but we know this is only going to last for another two, three months, and it needs to be on this admin front end API anyway. Uh, so we just have, um, we just move that, that SOAP endpoint also to the Go service. So now we can run the Java service and the Go service next to each other, because they're both announcing the same route. Um, and they're both getting traffic, and if we're not seeing any errors, well then we can kill off the Java service and then we're good. Uh, and this is in the, in the spirit of the constant refactoring. So, because my microservice architecture isn't static, it isn't stable, it, it constantly changes. Um, with, this, with this feature, uh, we can actually move endpoints around as we're moving services around. What if I don't want to hit my new SOAP service immediately with 100% or in this case 50% of traffic? So maybe I just want to you know, give it a more gradual push into existence. Um, then you have, another, you have another problem in a highly dynamic environment. So the way you usually configure load balancers if you want to have some weighted uh, traffic is that you have to, uh, you have to make up these, these, uh, these weights by yourself. So either you know how many instances you have and then you have to assign some weight numbers and you have to do, you know, you have to do the math of you know, service A and service B um, and, and attach this to the routing information when you configure the load balancer. So the way Fabio attacks this is that you can, in the manual overrides, you can also specify, well, please send 5% of traffic to this service. And this service could be, well, you know, service A slash bar with this git tag, uh, because you can also match on, on tags. Um, and it will send 5% of traffic um, to the new service, independent of whether you're running one or 100 instances. Um, so if you're only running one instance, it will send 5% of traffic to that one instance. If you're running 100 instances, well, each will get 0.05% of traffic. But in essence, your new version of the service will not be hit with 100% or 50% of the traffic. The performance that, that I tested, and please don't trust these numbers, run your own benchmarks as usual. Um, was that um, when I initially ran this, I wanted to see, well, is this, how fast is this? So I had a three box setup, so it is, so Fabio itself runs on a single box, but I have another, I have another machine in the same network, gigabit connected, uh, running the, um, re the requests um, using Way HTTP, and the, um, the actual HTTP server was running on a third box, so this was all physical hardware, um, which is one of our internal in-memory search engines, so there, you know, delivers uh, um, responses in like, you know, eight, nine milliseconds usually. Um, what I saw was that um, I was able to push uh, like 17,000 requests uh, through Fabio on a 16-core machine uh, without really saturating the machine uh, um, significantly. Um, that test instance was using 60 megabytes of memory, 6.0, um, and well, 
if I compare this to what my platform currently needs to deliver, this is about 3.2 times as much as I need. So I have this, I don't know, 100K Netscaler sitting there in front of our platform. And then I have this thing which is running on a three-year-old blade, which is good enough to run all of the traffic uh, for our platform. So it has been in production since September 2015. Um, the, um, the Mark Lutz guys, uh, which is part of, of eBay Classified, say, uh, so we had some internal discussions that you know, I was going to do something like this. And at some point, I heard, well, they just rolled this out. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, so, and rolling out in this case means, um, because they didn't really have any vested interest, it wasn't their pet project, it was just something that they saw well, and this could actually solve one of our problems, uh, was that they did a very deliberate rollout. So their side ops people you know, did the testing, you know, what happens when I kill this, you know, does it actually can handle the load? Um, now all the developers of Markdots, which is about 40, 45, are running this on their on their day-to-day -day laptops. Um, they get the latest version every morning, so I, I will, here quite quickly if I make a mistake with a git push. Um, and uh, well, they switched all of Markplatz um, to run it through Fabio. And so far, this has probably one of our most boring rollouts ever. <laughs> um, the same uh, happens with the platform that I'm responsible for, which is uh, Edmark, um, which has to handle 5,000 requests per second. So this was also quite meh, it was easy. Uh, the only glitch we found was uh, last uh, last weekend. Uh, I noticed that well, console doesn't actually make the service checks red when the node disappeared. So um, it was a three-line fix. So now the latest version has that fix. Uh, so we should, now we shouldn't be affected of that. Um, the Italians, I just found out. Uh, the, our Italian colleagues, I just noticed that they had started one of our internal repositories and they had this quietly deployed somewhere on their on their environment, and they're also quite happy with it. Um, we've done some capacity testing with, you know, how far could we actually push this, because Markplatz was running, and is normally running this on, on six to eight machines uh, on, on all of their front end, so they have, a, they have a Netscaler in front of it, which does the SSL termination, which just handles off the traffic, but the rule in the Netscaler is, well, any HTTP traffic goes over there. Okay? You don't care what it is, you just send it over there. Um, which means the configuration of the Netscaler, at least for that part, becomes very, very simple. Um, and then we gradually shut down one instance after the other to see, well, you know, at what point do we actually see some impact? And with two instances, um, we were seeing, okay, so now the latency is starting to go up a little bit. Um, so a site which does 8,000 requests per second, you can run on two blades with this. And it was still using only 250 megs of RAM and wasn't saturating the CPU. Um, We've written this in, in Go 1.5, um, because that's what I do right now. Um, it's, uh, there are numerous other reasons for which I could probably talk another hour or two, um, why I think this is a good idea, but that's topic for, for, a, different, uh, for a different talk. Uh, it delivers single static binary, um, and the Go um, standard library has an excellent reverse proxy already built in. So um, that's the thing that I'm leveraging. So all I'm doing is, is in essence, provide a lookup mechanism. So I get this input request URI, and then I figure out you know, which output request URL do I, need to, uh, do I need to use, and then I hand it off to the reverse proxy. Um, for, the, for the WebSocket proxy, I've written my own, um, which also is, I think, 30, 40 lines of code. It's not very difficult. So what are the benefits? One of the things that, that bug me most is that, um, or if I, if I want to talk about my vision, is, is I want to be able to run my application on my laptop exactly the way I'm running it on all the other environments. Uh, and since we're using MacBooks um, and our deployment environment is Linux, this is usually, um, there is usually some impedance mismatch. So since we've chosen to use Go as an environment, so that's not a hard requirement, but it's, it's something that makes it easier for us, is I just want to say, well, you know, just run all my Go binaries, which start up in a couple of seconds, um, and then just work, right? Um, so now I don't have to configure a load down, so I don't have to replicate that specific piece of the infrastructure anymore. So I still need a MySQL, I still need a Redis, I still need you know, whatever else we're, we're using as infrastructure. But at least that part of the environment, I don't have to replicate anymore. Because this is really just, okay, startup run, random ports, I don't care. Uh, one instance, five instances, doesn't matter. 
It also uh, um, fosters um, convention over configuration. So instead of configuring the load balancer we're just saying, well, you go figure it out, which means that the environment-specific configuration, again, is, is reduced a little bit, uh, which means our puppet recipes can, again, be trimmed down, which is now a year-long effort. So we've, we've been at it at this refactoring for about two years, and we're still not done. Um, but it, it gets us another step closer of really making um, our laptops the first QA environment. So that by the time you actually inject it into the pipeline, uh, and this is where you run all your big tests, um, the code is already vetted. So a couple of people asked me, um, well, do you have a roadmap? What's next? Um, I don't. Um, so it's, I'm, I want to take this, I wanna take this uh, um, forward um, gradually, so I don't I have some ideas on, on what, what I want to do with this, but mostly I want to see that this thing doesn't break stuff. So it, it solves a problem and it works and it's reliable and that's so that's the first and primary objective. Um, however, a couple of things uh, are, are in the works. So um, one of the other um, organizers of the Golan meetups, uh, Anis Miklai, has, uh, has implemented a different uh, backend uh, for Fabio, so this will soon work with the Google Compute, Cloud, uh, a Google Compute <coughs> Platform. Um, so that you can use it there. So uh, I expect that we merge this in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, then a couple of people have been asking me for transparent TCP, pro uh, TCP proxying. Um, in, in our own environment, I don't really see the need because uh, you can use the service discovery to find instances. So I can talk to the TCP service directly. So why would I need a proxy for that? Um, but there are some use cases uh, that, we've, that we've discussed which made this interesting. Um, the TCP proxy itself is just like the web, the WebSocket proxy, about 30, 40 lines of Go code. Um, I may have to add some, some kill switch in there to, to kill the connection, um, but it isn't, it isn't particularly difficult. It's more of, okay, so I have to bring up a listener dynamically uh, because the service now has to announce, well, please spawn a listener on that port um, and then route traffic uh, according to, to that port because that's the only information that I have with TCP. Um, I usually say Fabio is zero conf, um, and it is, except for one thing, which is certificate management. So if you want to run Fabio in a way um, that it does SSL termination, uh, you have to tell it during startup where to find the certificate files. And right now, this is being done through the, config, uh, through the properties file. Um, so since in our environment that wasn't really the pressing issue, it's like it looked like, okay, so I can do it like this, and then I'll move the entire configuration, including certificates, uh, into the registry backend a little bit later. Until someone opened up a ticket and says, well, you know, I actually would like to push tickets, uh, certificates via an API uh, into this thing because, you know, I have to do this a couple of times per day. Um, so it's like, so we're working on a solution for that. So this will soon be solved. But the plan is to have, um, to even get rid of the current config file and move that into the registry backend, uh, and then just apply uh, all the changes even without restart there. So uh, because most of the most of the settings, uh, let's say TCP uh, TCP tim timeouts uh, for HTTP slow attacks and, and these kind of things, you can just change on the fly. So there is no need to actually restart the the service for that. Um, then an HTTP API uh, would be nice. Um, so I have uh, one that serves currently two requests, but it's mostly driving the user interface. So I'm, I'm going to slowly, gradually uh, evolve that and maybe uh, even add a command line interface like you have with, with Google uh, for now. Um, but that will also evolve over time. So basic authentication was one of the other things that, that people requested, so that will probably be in for, for the user interface uh, that will be in, in, the next, in the next release. And that's it. Should I just throw the mic? <laughs> question, yes. A small question regarding the uh, certificates. Have you considered using a, a key vault or another secure store? Yes. So, um, okay. So, vault is uh, is certainly the thing that that is uh, that is on my list of things to do. Um, but it's uh, um, so it, it's I want to treat it as one of the options um, for uh, um, for the certificate store because um, well, as the as the original requester put it quite aptly, is uh, Fabio is already quite opinionated because it you know you need use you need to use console. 
Um, so Vault is. Uh, um, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna add Vault as one of the options um, uh, for uh, certificate management. Um, but it probably won't be the only option. So if you don't want to use Vault and you're happy with PKCS 12 uh, certificates and, and providing a, um, a password during startup, or even just putting the unencrypted files into, into the registry, then that's fine with me as well. Next question. Yes. Well, I would be really happy to see, uh, to hear something about uh, using console as a control plane, because we have heard about the uh, great performance of Fabio, but we don't really know uh, how's uh, console dealing with all that. Okay, um, what can you elaborate what you would want to know? There? So How big of a cluster are you using it with? Things like that. Yes. So, how many agents, servers? Okay, so we are, um, um, okay, so my, my, uh, our own platform consists of uh, 14, uh, make it 20 servers per, per data center. So, I have two data centers. Uh, we're running, but I'm, I'm not running active active, I'm running active passive. Uh, so we, we have uh, three masters and, and 20 agents. Um, we don't have a whole lot of uh, um, whole lot of state changes. Um, well, we had in the beginning when we thought it was a good idea to put the, um, the version uh, a timestamp into the response of the health check, uh, which just uh, puts console into um, uh, an update frenzy. So as soon as the health check doesn't change or only changes when something actually has changed, uh, and the services don't flap, um, the thing is quite stable. Um, uh, I haven't pushed it beyond that, but we have the, the, I think the colleagues in Canada, they're running it on a couple hundred nodes. Um, I can find that out. Um, so they also don't have any issues with this. Um, it's, it's mostly of case of what do you do with this? Um, then the, if, I, if I remember the, the HashiCorp quotes, um, I think at the last HashiConf, um, one of the guys mentioned about the half they have clients which actually run this on, on 10,000 servers. Um, they run uh, console nodes with 10,000 servers. Then I, my bet is that with anything that we're running, we're fine. So before I need 10,000 servers, uh, it'll be a long way. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, okay there's one down here in the front. Right? Yep. Yes. So I'm curious um, exactly what the Google Cloud integration entails. Um, perhaps I missed something, but it wasn't exactly clear what part of Google Cloud that would integrate with and why. So, in in essence, the um, so what if you look at the the registry backend, what this does is it, it expects um, well it expects two strings. Um, so, well, you know, here's the auto configuration, here's the manual configuration, um, and how you generate this is completely up to you. So this is uh, for Google Cloud. Um, there were, we're not using tags uh, because there is a different way of, of publishing the meta information. So it won't be exactly the same mechanism. Um, but from the from from Fabio's point of view, it doesn't matter. So the the backend uh, the backend plugin has to generate the, this configuration language, which is uh, um, well human readable and human editable by default because that gives me the opportunity to just concatenate the auto generated stuff and the manual overrides. Um, and as long as the backend plugin does that and allows for storing things in, in a registry and uh, retrieving it back, um, I'm good. So it's a service discovery backend, sort of. If you Im yes, yeah. But I mean, if you could, I mean, you could even just make it watch a config file. So there is no necessity of saying well because this is in in its simplest form, you could implement the backend which is just a file watcher. Um, it's it's very simple. Cool. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Oh. <laughs> any more questions? Yes. Is it usable as a drop-in replacement for the standard Go HTTP dot reverse proxy? In what sense? That it's so I, I wrote my own reverse proxy, just yes. like everyone else, but yes. I would like to use this one instead. Instead of the static binary, I would like to use it as a library. So I was wondering if it's easy to use in the library. 
Yeah, but I don't think that that is uh, that that makes a lot of sense because I'm I'm all I'm doing is 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 really just leveraging the built-in reverse proxy. So there is a um, so if you look at the proxy.go code, you'll see here's an incoming request. Go look up in the table, you know where this should go. Then you know maybe add some headers uh, based on the configuration, and then then pass it off to the reverse proxy. So that's all this thing does. So if you've already written your own reverse proxy. Um, I continue to use that. So the, the main purpose of, of, uh, of Fabio is um, to provide the, the automatic stateless configuration so that you don't have to worry about that. Uh, maybe a boring topic, but how did you secure this? Because I see a, a sort of console interface on a, on a web. So that's exactly the. Um, so in, in our environment, it runs uh, it runs in a kind of secured network, and we put it. Um, so that that part we have currently unsecured, but I have the chain ready um, so that uh, the um, the API will be behind HTTPS. If you well, let me rephrase. If you enable authentication, then you will be required to run on HTTPS, um, and then you can choose either uh, um, to use basic authentication or a client certificate authentication. Um, for which you would have then to provide the client certificate. If you don't provide a certificate, then my plan is to have a built-in certificate so that, again, it, its batteries included, it'll work. But you can use your own certificate. But yes, so with uh, authentication, it'll, uh, um, then it's, it's going to be secure. Okay. Okay, okay one more. Yes. Um, I was wondering, does it have any like error counting? Does it do anything with uh, counting of errors? And if he says that one node is dead, does it uh, load balance to the other node? So, um, one, so well, to answer the second part of your question, yes, because what in, uh, but it doesn't do that because I've written any special code for it. Because what happens is that when the when a particular instance is dead, then that health check will be read, uh, which means the health check. Um, the, the internal console state has changed, so then Fabio will fetch the entire state, uh, will build a new routing table which does not include that dead service, and therefore um, it will not route any traffic to it anymore. So if a, if a health check goes, uh, uh, goes red uh, for a service which is, let's say, in shutdown, it will not kill existing connections, so it will just, uh, it will just remain, uh, the, the ones that are, uh, that are still active will continue to function. Um, the thing that uh, I just noticed, I forgot to mention, is that it has um, it has uh, uh, graphite reporting built in because again that's what we use internally. But I'm using the Go metrics library to support other backends as well. So it does uh, um, uh, latency throughput uh, per route per host per endpoint, and it has a total request counter. But if there are if there's request for more different uh, um, different uh, metrics, it's easy to add. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're going to stop it there. Um, are you going to stick around for the rest of the day? Um, I'm going, well, I can have this one here. So if you want to find the code, then this is where it is. Um, this is how you can reach me. Uh, I'm going to stick around until 5. Okay, so any more questions, go and find Frank and he can answer them for you. Big round of applause, please.